Um, he's not going to come down. Do you want to uh, call uh, the bill? Yes, sure. Yeah, this one's recording. on me. This one's on me. I'm sorry. No, it's I'm okay. recording. We are the Chiltern uh, Firehouse. And, uh, okay. and we have You're a very, be... very simpatico gentleman asking us to pay. We're just going to do that. Can we just... But no thanks. But we're not going to close it. As we just started, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know. I just we don't feel like paying up to every single class. Yeah, but either we need to pay as you go, or you need to. You're going to be on the air. Yes, yes, yes. That's You're part of the interview right now. Oh, okay. Hashtag. So yeah, you have to pay. As what was your you, name? You, you, you will be. Magic. You, Sorry. Magic. I will tip you at the end. Okay. I will tip you at the oh, end. Oh, his name is Magic. Okay. Well. Okay. okay. We'll see the rest. Yes. Thank if, if we did. Right. How many beginnings this interview will have? <laughs> well, um, prismically talking. I As believe... is Firuz, welcome in London. Um, is it going to be a fiery conversation because you proposed to Chilton Firehouse? So there is always something when you propose something. Well, um, I put, proposed the idea to uh, meet in this place because I needed to uh, investigate. Investigate uh, the architecture and the display of the Chilton Firehouse. Uh, in view of a possible installation for Freeze Art Week in October. So an investigator and an instigator together <laughs> under one roof. I Makes mean, for... We've never been simple, have we? <laughs> well, um, um, I believe that the sum of our complexities uh, makes for a simple message. Let's drink for that. Mm -hmm. We do not really appreciate the input of non-insiders. We do not really appreciate the input of people that don't care about us wearing jellabas in the tube, um, which I would call the informed mass of darkness. Do people care about anything or anyone, anyway? Well, that makes our job even more than the important. We hold the fire. And in that darkness, we show them the way. Can we do anything Hello. about it? You as an artist and me as a, someone who's holding a, a plume, a, plume a, a pen and, and sharp words. I mean, the way Apollinaire uh, was a friend of uh, Braque, and the way Braque was a friend of Pablo Picasso in 1904, makes a good example on how, yes, a plume, and a an contemporary visual artist can change things, yeah. Maybe we should be s sitting in Paris at Café de Flor for the rest of the conversation? I um, think that at that time, <laughs> things were mostly happening in Montparnasse. <laughs> yeah, because you were, you, you're always uh, uh, an, um, an outsider. Um, I don't Asymmetric, understand. Asymmetric, uh, yes. unorthodox. You always go against the floor. Whilst I like comfort. So I would be sitting at cafe floor while you were with your crowd <laughs> at Montparnasse. Well, Nesbar. you know. Select. At the select. Ingratiate no. myself with the ghosts of Hemingway. Oh, his brasserie was just just, just um, next door. Exactly. Brasserie de Lila. Yes. That we all love. Oh. Right. So my time in Paris has also has been uh, rounding back. I've uh, moved from, uh, last time we saw each other, from uh, Spain to Athens for a year and a half. Oh, uh, I had that to... was the period when we did not talk, right? Yes, I, I oh. did the Venice Biennale also oh, in that okay. period, which was very sad because it made me sad because I really wanted you to have on that VIP dinner that was called Starry Nights on the Silk Road. Well, it was two years ago, right? When I, I totally ignored you. You did, yes. And you did not invite me. And so I, I nomadized my way more. around your ignorance. <laughs> I nomadized my way around your ignorance. I love doing that. But... 
We were so good at it. <laughs> yeah, it, was a, it, it was a nice yeah. ballet. It was a nice well, ballet. Absolutely. Now, now we jumped. We jumped back into and the pit. Exactly. Yes. Do you still have sand in your shoes? From Funny Marrakesh. you mention, yes, uh, I haven't washed my socks yet. No, <laughs> disgusting <laughs> artist. And that was a joke, by the way, for the record. Oh, no, 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 he's yeah. not joking, I know. Mm. Yes, um, the, the sound sphere permits uh, the sound to be recorded, so we don't have the technology yet to record smells. But you left Marrakesh quite quick after we saw each other at 154. Well, um, I do opening, not right? think that my presence on art fairs makes any difference after the moment I met the three persons I wanted to meet over breakfast before your VIP start. That's the presence way always make a difference. Yes, but you make your presence felt uh, at the right moment for a short time. Oh, I time. was one of them. Yes. Oh, God. I filed for it. Fireproof. Filed for it. Oh. <laughs> I insisted mildly and then even a bit more. And uh, we met. And um, the fact is, uh, Marrakesh uh, art scene, I believe, uh, has reduced its capacities in the last two or three years. The East Saint Laurent Foundation is not doing any events anymore. And I found. It's rather boring. Yeah. Oh, I must say. It, it was very I mean, linear, wasn't I, I didn't even go this, this time. Was it, it was very linear. Oh, you know. Um, even though I applaud Turia Glawi's initiative, I think that hopefully in the years to come, there's going to be more public program exhibitions, a bit more risks taken. Might not be in their interest. I mean, who would be the best person to answer this question? Well, I talked to Turia. Turia. I did. Absolutely. I did. And? And uh, I've just proposed, and this is just fresh, we have a meeting next week with Turia and Sue Whaley, that's the ex-CEO of Alexander McQueen, uh, to, to, to basically draw, because I entered a year of collaborations and cross-sections, oh. and um, I want to draw... That's why you thought of me. Yes. Oh, I'm so delighted. Yes, you're exactly Thank at that place. You. Thank you. You're a cross-section between the different disciplines of I beauty. Lo I love to be cross-section. And uh, so we... Uh, excuse me, sir. Uh, per favore, amico. Magic. Oh, you're not magic. Una, una Where is magic? Olive, magic. Una, una, una Can we have olive, magic back? Una... Magic. Magic is uh, around. Olive. You have Thank some you. olives or something. Yeah, come yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I uh, discussed, and we're about, we're to, we're to jump on a Zoom next week with Sue Wiley. Uh, that's you know a force in independent fashion making. Um, as you know, Alexander McQueen was famously independent, and uh, she was his CEO, and she has his own brand now. And uh, we are we want to create a module together, which I'm going to create with her. That's going to be her pop-up module for our next season. And she wants to travel the world as a traveling pop-up with her, with her collection. Right. And my creation of her pop-up through different events. And we want to propose that to Turia for next year. Where are you meeting her? Um, like in Marrakesh? I think the server London? might be somewhere in Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> He's lying through his teeth. No, on Zoom, obviously. Oh, okay. So she's um, in New York right now. So. Tell me about your art foundation between Marrakesh and Soria. Um, what is it? I mean, you found a house and you. Uh, this is for uh, me total magic in 25 years of action in the creative world. I've had this dream since the late 90s where I covered as an experimental documentarist uh, and ethnologically and musically the first Nawa festival of Isawira and I fell in love with that area and um, especially the coast towards Agadir, 10 kilometers on the city Kauki. And all these years I had this yearn to go back there and nothing really, you know, on all the cross roads and, and back roads and the maquis that went with brought me really back there. And until 
um, I completed my action as an artist. I think, you know, I don't think an artist does the Venice Biennale two times in their lives, especially not a national pavilion. So I think I topped what I could basically do, I think, at a, at a personal yearning level. I think whatever I do after the Biennale for me is just going to complete things. But I think I've, I've, I've reached the higher I could. I mean, without an art gallery, I'd be very happy, to, for instance, you know, move to more institutional museums later in my life. But in the independent thrust that I did uh, with foundations, backers and such, the Venice Biennale gave me an opening as a textile artist that brought me today to develop action between design, fashion and contemporary art through production of uh, art rug lines and that brought me to get into ceramics that got me to maybe work even on fabrics for the collection of uh, Suede next year. Mm. So this whole connection, the Venice Biennale was an explosion. Tell me actually... about the Venice Biennale because some of the uh, um, people who listen to this might not know, might not be aware uh, what you did and your collaboration with the embassy and so forth. Well, um, what was it? I mean, when the... Um, when the show we did together in 220 happened, I got nominated to the V&A Jamil Prize that gave me a, a note further to, to do something in the continuity of that same blueprint that I call the post-tribal that, that mixes uh, tribal elements, semiotics, textiles to uh, crafting them by uh, local associations, helping craftswomen, redirecting money through NGOs and creating a, a, a total work of art installationally that mixes all of them in an installation involving also video and sound that uh, right. I create with four double L R M that is my uh, my my sonic platform and that when the COVID happened um, was a bit of a frustration at first because I, you know but it helped me because. I was a bit too much in a rush, and the fact that there was no more rush to be had made me thinking. I said, what would be the next iteration of that post-tribal idea I have? So I thought, well, while we're at it, let's do the best. And the best um, art um, initiative or um, art event uh, that the world has at this exact moment is the Venice Biennale. So you have three layers of it. You have every two years, that was the 59th, and we are just entered in the 60s, right. 60th that's going to open in, uh, in a month or so, in April, month and a half. And you have the pavilion exhibitions. Um, in the pavilion exhibitions, you have the countries that have a concession, such as France, England, that have like a, a stone and brick and stone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You have, a, you have like... Um, he brought us olives mm, okay. and almonds. Mm. An Italian man bringing <laughs> olives and almonds. Mm. Mm. Lovely. In London, lovely. There you go. Lovely. Lovely. <laughs> and so, you know, um, the, the big countries have their concessions on 100 years in the Giardini. Mm. But the smaller countries don't have that kind of money. So basically, they have to fight every two years to be present on the, on the Biennale if they take the initiative, the ministry seat. So some countries have never actually done it. Kyrgyzstan being one, Morocco being another one. They just canceled their, their pavilion for this year. We won't discuss this live, but oh, okay. you know, it was Mehdi Bin Bin that was in charge, and very biz bizarrely, it was cancelled. But Kyrgyzstan had never done that. So basically, what happened, to make it short, is that during the COVID, I thought it over. I thought it over, and I said, okay, let's do it. I called Uzbekistan to start from, because in the continuity of my thought, being an Iranian exile, the... Um, the relationship I wanted to have next with tribes would have been Persian, but as I am blocked from that country for political reasons, I went down the alley of myth. And my country uh, is actually uh, a mixture of different cultures, the Turkic one being very important because uh, in, the, in the Turkic uh, invasions um, in 1200, 1300, uh, new dynasties were, um, were installed. And, um, and the Safavid one, for instance, that was the one that uh, preceded uh, Nadir Shah, um, was entirely Turkic. So and my family comes from the invasions that came after Genghis Khan from the north, over, over the Aral Sea. So I followed Is that... Is it dangerous to sit with you here? anyone going to shoot me you know, you know we got a bit more civilized our cousins and I we like the guillotine a bit better than the saber and, <laughs> and that's why we are sitting in London right mm -hmm. it's safe and um, so I basically ingratiated myself with myths and poetry from uh, old old Iranic 
um, traditions such as the Shah Nameh, the Book of Kings, to make it easy. And I found out that basically my family, my tribe, maybe 500 years ago, came from over the Aral Sea on the steppes, and maybe even from Kyrgyzstan. So I thought, okay, I will call my, 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 my show the Gates of Turan, because that's the gates that they took to come into Persia. So the Gates of Turan. So I, I called it that way, and I went to see the Ministry of Culture, in in, uh, in Kyrgyzstan to make it short. Right. Mm -hmm. I sent a fax. He went up the ladders. It's very like still linked to the Soviet order, so it's very bureaucratic. And that fax got to a guy at the International Bureau that called me. Who the heck are you? I said, man, I got a project. I got a funding from the Floor Family Foundation. That's uh, the foundation of uh, Mr. Hewitt Packard's wife, Flora, that gave me a handsome, fast um, seed. Um, donation for me to go to Kyrgyzstan. Right. And um, obviously, at first, I didn't think I would do um, a pavilion. I was just there to basically propose to the government to do a show with their backing that would be a collateral show during the Vienna's Biennale. Yeah. That would be just, I just asked for permission to be true to you. But it worked marvelously. Well, when they, when they learned about it and when they heard that they, they never had a pavilion before, the question during the meeting when the minister came up, he said, While you're at it, why don't you do the pavilion? You know? Wow. I said, sure, so you got, you got to have to give me some legitimacy. So he said, well, I'll give you cultural ambassador. So I became a cultural ambassador, and that was my first political role in my life um, for a year, a year and a half. I had to navigate angry seas because, to be true to you, the Kyrgyz artists were not that enchanted for a guy like me to represent them. Is it a time when I'm going to ask you uh, what is it like to be Persian? Yes, it is the time when I'm going to ask you. What is it like to be Persian? We got a common trait with the Greeks that we fought in Marathon and Salamis famously badly. But, <laughs> yeah, it did model the Western world, these two battles. We always look back to the past. You would see a Greek in a taxi. You can discuss of his 3,000 year construct as easy as he would discuss the coffee he had in the morning. We Persians are a bit the same and we feel infatuated in a wrong and a positive way by the past empire that we were. And um, we still believe, and when you see how the Ayatollahs are reacting today and the, the, they're, they're following the same line, they have imperialistic, you know, endeavorly, endeavors and, 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 and yearns because they are sitting on the laurels of two, three thousand years of, 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 of glory. So, and what can you do? As a Persian, we love glory. Yes, as Persians <laughs> love glory. We're very much, I feel very close to the Romans, to the that. old Romans. I've got quite a few Persian friends here and I can second them. We're very close to the old school Romans <laughs> in that sense. You know, we're a culture that... They that, love that, to shine. Oh, <laughs> we, there is a saying that, you know, um, that one and the other has uh, the sun shining over their heads more than the other. And this is not a good thing. It creates competition and bitterness. Mm. We can be very bitter between each other, very jealous and very competitive. Oh, perfect. In the search of excellence. It almost evokes me to call my Persian friends, invite them now, and join the conversation. And I always say to friends that don't know us... See what happens. <laughs> I always say to friends that don't know us, you know, people do that. They say, Firuz, you have to come to my dinner tonight. I've invited a great Persian friend. That's a great artist. You're going to love him. And I'm like, guys, you have to understand, we're not going to love each other at all. Ooh. We're both going to think that one or the other has stolen you as a friend. Oh. And that's going to happen. It's going to be bad. And the introduction is not going to work out well. Oh. That's how bad we are. You know, I had a conversation once to answer to that question in a very beautiful way. Um, Queen Farah invited me over uh, at her palace that she sold, by the way. Oh, that was absolutely incredible to meet her a couple of years ago in Marrakesh. I remember that. At the show. At the show. At your show. Between the carpets, the queen. Right. 
Silence. With our no, entourage. I mean, just, just with really, our entourage. Well, yeah, yes, 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 yes. But it's still... Yeah, and um, quite and moving. Moving. Uh, she's a moving person. She's uh, she's an aunt to all of us. <laughs> us Persians, especially us in exile. She's our aunt. Met. And anyway, so, I'm a Persian. Not but us, I, to but us I, Persians. I, I, but I have you a, understand what I mean. I, I have a flying carpet, but I'm not Persian, unfortunately. But I, I love I love your ride. I do understand. You had a good ride, man. <laughs> <laughs> Let's drink for that. Yes, sure. Excuse Where's me, my, my barman? He needs attention. You're recorded. You are recorded. No, 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 come. Don't, he don't wants be, another don't be so margarita, shy. I think. No. Um, one more. One beer and a. Um, but no ice. Make it classic. You know? Yes. But, um, salty? Yes. Okay. No ice. Follow me outside. Oh, are we? Where are we going? God. Firuz is taking me out. Hello. I'm recording. You're part of it. Interview. So we are now on the Chopin Firehouse's terrace. And Firuz is smoking. Not telling you what, but never mind. Hmm. It's a marble hmm. light uh, pack <laughs> that I bought on the boat from Tangiers to Tarifa. Well, I have to beep you out because this is not advertising here, okay? It's not product advertising. Thank you. So on the boat from Tangiers to Tarifa a couple of days ago, <laughs> because I, I, I traveled to Isawira, then to Tangiers, then I took the boat to Tarifa, to Europe, and you buy cigarettes for 28 euros, the whole pack, the 10 pack, the carton. Well, that mm. doesn't that's, that's for you guys. Dude. That doesn't impress me because I don't smoke. So, um, so you were saying, so let's change the subject. Shall I was we? telling you about how to be. And Good. so the, the queen had me for lunch. Oh, this is where we are. Okay. Because, we because are the day before, a, she had uh, laughed her head out with me because coming to my show, Everybody was bowing, and when she got to we me... We are in Venice, right? No, we're in Marrakesh in 216, 217. Oh, oh okay. Sorry. And, and we're in Marrakesh at the God, Museum of Marrakesh. We still have a four years to cover here. God. And I mean, um, how long are you going to talk for? I mean, really. The time of maybe two, <laughs> two three beers, I guess. I think that'll be... All right. Okay, so we are back in Marrakesh. And um, just this, how to be a Persian, what, what it means to be a Persian, is very well explained by this little anecdote. And, and she tells me, or she brings me, anyway, we had a good laugh together at my show. She invited me the day after to a big lunch on at a palace. And, and, she, and there was 30 people, she placed me next to her. And she, took me, and she took me aside during the lunch and said, but Firuz, why is your aunt Hoide and your aunt Parveen hating each other so bad and getting into fights all the time? And I said, Queen. Parvin's in, in Paris, no? Parvin is now in Palma. Oh, oh. Okay. But she used to be in she, Paris, yes. She had her a fashion brand. Fabulous brand-up. gallery. Never mind. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, off record. And answered this. I said, You put two Iranians at the end of one street, because both of them had the decoration outfit in, in Mallorca at the same time. And you put two Iranians at the, at the end of the same street, they destroy themselves and the street. <laughs> you put two Whoa. Jewish, you put two Jewish. At the end of the same street, they take the street and then the city. And they built mm-hmm. another and then, one. And they built another one. <laughs> All right. She laughed. And that's the thing. How to be a Persian explains quite well what I just said. And very funny, like a year later, people that heard my anecdote said, Firuz doesn't like the Iranians. He likes the Jews. <laughs> it, you know, and the rumor spread. And what? <laughs> yes. Okay. Right. Um, mm. Which is true. I am very much friends with that tribe. I find them highly interesting. Um, the way they entertain uh, history through the ages. Gorgeous men, gorgeous girl, and the photographer. Fabulous. So we will not get into uh, a conversation on that topic because politics are out of this conversation. Yes, yes, yes. Please. So I wanted to tell you also that obviously uh, there is a reference to have on your question, which is the famous works of the Enlightenment. Uh, the writers of the Enlightenment in France, very precisely Montesquieu, wrote a book that was a critique oh, of the society the of the times. Letters. The letters. Oh. Yeah, Les Lettres Persanes. Let's talk about Montesquieu, shall we? 
let's go back inside to do that. Oh. Thank you first. We are walking back to the bar. Everybody's smiling around us. And the bar is here. So there we go. It's here, it's still here, it's still here. The wallet is still here. <laughs> Breakfast time, Malaysia. Hey, Breakfast, Breakfast time. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Yes, 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 yes. I wish the first one would have been like just this. a bottle, Baba. It's just a bottle. Just a bottle. Let me know what you think. Um. Nice music. Oh, it was an interval. Oh, what was it? Uh, nothing. I was. Um, Are we going to sing? Yeah, I like soul music. And I think. Okay. Oh. It's not Al Green, but it could be Al Green. It is Al Green. So, cheers. Where's your drink? I ordered one there for you. Go. Oh, okay. Good. Can't get enough of your loving. Can't get enough of your loving. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! La, la. I think it's actually Stevie Wonder. You're right. But I so, love both of them. Absolutely, absolutely. Especially the early Stevie Wonder. <laughs> so, How to Be a Persian by Montesquieu was a critical um, essay. On, um, on, the, on the establishment of the time. He just used, you know, the Persian uh, thing because at the time you have to realize that you were in the pre-colonial times and um, you had a Persian invoice that Didn't came... Didn't it have two parts, the letters? They, I think they had two, two parts. Two sections? It dates back to the 17 whatever. It, da it dates Ooh. to the days of the great game where Russia and England were struggling for power and France was uh, moving towards Napoleon and trying to have his gambit in the same in the same arena. And England still had some power. A lot. Unlike yeah. now. That's when the time was <laughs> quoted as the empire on which the sun never sat. <laughs> Boy. So um, basically you had Persians coming to, to France from the Qajars, which was my family that was in power at the time. And, um, and they would come and hang there and um, come with their Persian ways. And they did a sensation on the social scene in Paris with their robes and their chapans and stuff. So there was this fashion of how to be a Persian was this way of saying, if you're not from this place, how would you see the system coming you know, with a fresh mind? So that was what Montesquieu used to do his critique of the establishment. So he used the Persians as a way of deconstructing his works very well with you. I mean, who could ignore you, really? You know what? <laughs> a lot of people. I've, uh, you know, the, for the Venice Biennale, uh, we've um, a production company in Paris called Hesi Film, um, and a producer called Nadim Ketane for Lebanon mm. produced the film on my adventures in Kyrgyzstan and in Venice, mm. in London and also in Dubai, where I was funding the thing. And they did a beautiful film, and they proposed it to French Netflix and to Arte. And they both found it way too off-center from what the French <laughs> public could understand. Good. But that means you were good. So, you know, I get ignored quite often. I guess it's a so convenient... So I think I'm doing very well. <laughs> Right. Um, let's jump from uh, Venice to Marrakesh, yeah. shall we? Le to or the Riyadh. Shall, shall we? Riyadh. Yes. Yeah. I, think, I think you asked me to kind of like put into perspective what I did in Venice, and uh, we worked with the craftspeople. We did a great job. You know, we got about our PR company, my desk, gave out the ciphers. We made uh, an impact on 20 million people on the on the promotion of the. Of, and so we did our mission as a as an amb ambassador to culture. We put Kyrgyzstan on the map, and um, and that was my job. So I was happy to call it a success. 
So what's next? How would you like to annoy people right now, I am, in the future? Um, I'm digging into the idea as I was tagged as a textile artist. I got approached by high-end rock producers in Italy, in London, uh, to create a limited edition textile works that would be more, you know, developed for the design industry. And it's been very nice for me because it kind of opens up um, other types of collectors um, and other types of collaborations that are bringing me to now possibly work in the fashion industry. So right now, I'm kind of moving away from, from the kind of institutional shows I did um, at that time and going towards um, something a bit more, um, how to say, related to, um, to funding my activities in a different way, meaning finding a template that can be a functional one for me to be independent in the future and do other things. So I'm trying to find um, a business model that can have a workable turnaround year long, um, as I don't want to sign with an art gallery, um, to be able to continue. you still don't want to sign? No. Why? I haven't, you know, the question came up today with a collector friend we had lunch with today, uh, Edward Baker, that's one of my sponsors. And um, I told him, listen, said, some galleries are good. I said, listen, right now, in the continuity of my conversations and my happenstances, I haven't had a beer with anyone that was able to basically convince me to work for a commercial gallery. I did have a link with the director of Tadeusz Kopak in Paris, but you know what you told me? She said, listen, I'm going to be director... Florian. Huh? Florian? No, she's a Greek woman. It's all right. And uh, she said, what I learned is that Tadeus is going, to make, is going to make her go to another gallery in two months. And basically, there's no continuity. There's, uh, there's you know, there's, it's very business oriented. Uh, when you get into a good conversation with someone that's a director of one of the Tadeus Lopak, that person might get fired two months later. So, you know, you don't find trust there. No comment there, because I work with a gallery, so... Um, um, I'm just listening now. So, I don't call. I don't cold call, I don't, I just travel. So, I haven't in my travels found, right now, the right adequation to... to I, one thing I don't like is making any cues, and galleries have a system that don't function for me is that they do rosters and a roster is 10 different artists fighting for the slot all year round Absolutely. and you've got the yeah. top tier that's going to have the, the shine so you have to be not so basically you're, fi you're fighting with 10 artists instead of fighting the world so you're losing your career your time if you don't have a, a gallery that's going to push you really in a type of patronage relationship then basically you're just going to be on a waiting list so what I'm going to ask you uh, to send some images for this um, interview to publish, what are you going to send me? Well, I want to talk about what we're doing now in Asawira first. Oh, good. That really interests me. You know how my heart is back there in the desert. In that mysterious, beautiful, very, very kind culture. We agree. We agree on that. Well, my birthday Very came Very few out. people would understand that, unless they've been. But not, not as a tourist and traveler, it's just it's a traveling soul. Yes, exactly. Uh, you have to dig in deep in the um, history and uh, full of respect for the well, people. One, otherwise, you will not understand anything. Like my father says very rightly so. Your father the, lives there, right? Yes. He said, very decided, he said, the beauty of the Moroccans is that they are the corner of Africa that nobody was really interested in conquering in 4,000 years. So they, they haven't had, you know, the Ottomans, they haven't had, the only conquest that really came part of that is the Muslim conquest. And it took them 200 years yeah. to get through to that. Anyway, that's... Well, I think we, we both come from countries which were invaded in a very ugly way, right? Yes, we, uh, we're, 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 we're used to rape. To <laughs> we're used to rape. Rape. Rape, you said? Yes. Oh, yeah, that's true. We've been I, raped. I mean, uh, even rape is part of our identity. Intellectually. Intellectually uh, and culturally. Oh, poor. And culturally as well. Yeah, we don't talk about them. They don't deserve it. 
they don't deserve them. But the force of Persian culture through all of these rapes or conquests is that um, we always kind of were able to sponge them in and make them Persian. Alexander died in Persia because he felt more Persian than Greek after leaving, yes, living up in a year there. <clears throat> and Thank you for reminding my surname, but um, Alexander the Great went there with a different idea. Well, he respected the, 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 what he had Had conquered. a war there, so it's... Um, Oh, well, are, we, are we going back that far? No, no, oh, we're good. Not. So you. we were just saying that um, Morocco I'm just has, about to uh, has with a very my margarita. peaceful, well, yeah, <laughs> has a very peaceful mindset because they have not had that. So they're peaceful people. They're not big warriors. They're people that are very kind and quite generous in their in their souls. And that's something that's really enticing when you live in Morocco. You can feel that uh, there is a warmth. There's a true warmth and uh, and always. So how did it happen? You were just driving on the, on the road to Assouan, and suddenly you just saw a, 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 a rear the house, and you said, "That's mine." No, it was my birthday, and I told my oh. wife, uh, "Listen, as we move back to France, I don't want to open my workshop in France. I want to open it in Assouira. It's my birthday." So, and we she went... got your house. Oh, I exactly. love your wife. Exactly. Exactly. Oh. So we went there in January, and I always work with a friend of mine called Aziz, uh, that's uh, Marakshi, old story, old friend. And the way we did it, we sat in a coffee for breakfast, we smelt that the right person was at the kiosk, we went to the kiosk, we asked for a rental of a car, we went to the rental of a car, we saw the guy was okay, and as you know in Morocco, when you rent a car, you also rent a house. So we said to the guy, okay, the it's deal, true. I mean, um, you rented the car very well, good price, good, get me a house. And he was dressed like Don Johnson, oh C. Abdallah, very much of a personage. And he basically brought in a drunkard called Si Mohammed that knew everybody in the rural areas. <laughs> and Camilla loved him. He was singing a Mazir song. He said, no, I, I. So we put him in the car and we drove to the rural areas. And we started basically improvising with people he knew and such. And until we hit the house um, of my friend Juliette. So my friend Juliette, Ménager's mother, was a very famous decorator that had bought Majorelle's house in Marrakech All right. in the 50s, 60s, and then sold it to Pierre Berger a long time after. And she's an old school um, Moroccan person that's now in Paris, is a very installed um, um, casting director that for instance, did the casting of Emily in Paris for Netflix lately anyway. And she's a madame there. So I have had already gone to see her for my, you know, my, um, my um, hellos uh, for a coffee the day before. It was as a surprise when the car pulled in in front of her house saying, well, and her house is the house of the Caid, which is the governor. The governor right. at the time. And it's a beautiful palace. And it has an annex next to it that her mother hadn't bought. And is inhabited by uh, local Moroccans. And that man oh, wow. um, needed money and suddenly said, well, I'll rent you the annex of the palace. She got the suitcase out from the back of the car and said, here you go. Here in, you in, in, in a few words, <laughs> in a few words, in three days the deal was done. And um, so right. basically I was with an architect called Allery Campbell Garrett, right. um, a friend of my, of my cousin and me. And uh, he decided to come in with us, so we did a 50-50 deal. As a part of the Riyadh, I have the other. And we started, thanks to him being an architect, we started refurbishing the Riyadh entirely. So when is it going to be ready or open? Even the knobs and even the, the grillages on the floor made up by the iron monger are of my design. Oh, wow. The whole, our endeavor is to make the Riyadh, the art Riyadh, a piece of art. We're making the Riyadh itself an artwork. Like you, walking inside you. So, um, <laughs> I think we're like 70% uh, there. Right now we have um, refurbishments going on for the water rooms and for the kitchen. And we have refurbished the rooms. Uh, everything with the local craftspeople. And we have um, an intendant, uh, a Riyadh manager that's taking care of all that now, Mr. Hussein. And, um, we will have it at least ready for guests. 
for Persian New Year on the 21st of March, meaning at about the month. And um, we're throwing a dinner on the 22nd down. Very, I just say, friendly dinner. But I will actually have works that I've developed there put as banners falling from the walls of the Riyadh. And we'll show our collections of knobs and ceramics that we're developing with the local artisans. So that will be the thematic of the Riyadh, will be a collaborative, friendly place. Not an art residency, ever. Ever. I hate those. No. Only people of people that come from love and light. Oh. I love my position. You are. You have your room, my friend. So you have my suite, that's called the Princess's Suite, because I dedicated it to my wife. Then we have a guest room called the Princess's Guest Room. That's the room you can have if you come. And then we have my atelier, that's also a sound and a recording studio. And then you have on the other side, Mr. Alaric's um, room. He's into monastic Buddhism, so it's more like we got him the monastic suite. So, and he's gonna have his, um, his, his studio on the roof. So it's like a venture between my studio, FFF studio, and a sorted studio, uh, this architecture studio of London, making this Riyadh something that um, I think will unique. be unique. Yeah. My dear Pirus, we shall continue our conversation over the part, and part three. So I will make the invitation formal. Oh, thank you. I love formal invitations. I will not respond until. You're invited <laughs> to the Persian New Year <laughs> thank you. dinner thank you. Thank at you. the Art Riyadh at the occasion, on the occasion of the presentation of my la latest designs derivated from Berber talismans called the Fibulas. And the show is going to be called Fibulae, as in Latin. <laughs> well, on that note, we return to our drinks and more music. We would advise you. <laughs> no, no brands pronounced. No brands pronounced beer and no brands pronounced margaritas at the bar of the Chiltern Firehouse. Thank you. You're most welcome, and I'm looking forward oh, to the, yes. the, 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 the what I always ask from you. Mm -hmm. um, the last sentence in, uh, in Farsi. Of course. I mean, what else? Zoltan Jan, das dar nakhore, koshoshodam. Oh, wow. Thank you.